Welcome to our live broadcast from the Mountain of God Tabernacle, high atop Mont Eagle Mountain, Tennessee. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I'd like to tell you that we are a five-fold, full gospel, interdenominational church, which offers contemporary praise and worship, the teaching of God's Word, healing, deliverance, prophetic ministry, and much more. We are located in beautiful downtown Mount Eagle, Tennessee at 331 King Street. That's at the corner of King and Fourth. Our Sunday morning worship service starts at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, and everyone is welcome. Now, if for some reason you cannot attend our sanctuary, be sure to join our live stream at wildfireonthemountain.com. That physical address again is 331 King Street, or you can watch us live at www.wildfireonthemountain.com wildfireonthemountain.com No, 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 no. He's good. He's good. He's good as he deserves. He deserves more. Welcome to Mountain God Tabernacle. We're glad you're here with us this morning by uh, DVD or internet. We're going to start with the sounding of the shofar.
came as a man, the creator of the universe, he had a perfect plan. And I'm a living, dying proof, your mercy never fails, the old man dies each day.
telling me to mention it again this morning that the tabernacle of David that is to be raised the raising of the tabernacle isn't just at one facility or one building or within one local body of Christ it's actually all those churches out there who learn to praise him in spirit and in truth that's the raising of the tabernacle of David now, we got some that have been led in a way that we was earlier led to the Lord kind of straightened our course out, that you would be in one particular church, one particular building, one particular local body of Christians, and that they would be raising up the tabernacle of David, yet the churches down the road are somewhere who may be praising God in spirit and in truth, and praising God according to what the Bible says you're supposed to do as a sacrifice of praise. It's like they've been excluded. And the Lord's saying, no, they haven't. Any, anybody of Christ that learns how to praise him with holy hands, to praise him with a shout to the Lord, praise him by adoring him and showing that love and that adoration, that is the raising of the tabernacle. And I thank you, Lord that we're among those who are raising the tabernacle of David. Some of y'all might not understand why it's called the tabernacle of David because you have to search the tr scriptures kind of deep to understand it and you have to read uh, some of what the Jewish sages have said and have recorded and have passed down through the centuries. And when David had his tabernacle, tabernacle means tent, when David had his tent before Solomon built the temple for God, he had 24-7 praise and worship. And he worshiped uh, Yahweh with spirit and in truth, which means David knew about singing to the Lord. He knew about being a psalmist because he was one. He knew about shouting to the Lord, raising holy hand to the Lord. 
<clears throat> this is what he did in his tabernacle. And it did continue even into Solomon's time when uh, Solomon's temple was built. But soon after that, somewhere down through the ages, it disappeared. And then when Catholicism came in, it was let the little boys sing, the boys choir and certain things. You don't really find that in Scripture. That's not true worship. That's not worshiping in spirit and truth. Now, the word hymn is in the Bible, so it is scriptural. You can, read a, you can sing a hymn to the Lord. But how do you sing a hymn? You're supposed to sing a hymn not trying to stutter through the words and sing a song that nobody knows. It's a song that everyone should know so that you can read it if you have to, but you don't have to read it if you know it and got it in your spirit and you're raising holy hands to God and you're praising him, even if it's a hymn. Brother Paul here, Pastor Paul, he can play songs like uh, How Great Thou Art, and if you're raising your holy hands to the Lord, that's praise and worship. If you're sitting there in your seat waiting for him to finish the song so you can do whatever you want to do, nod out, go to sleep, or whatever, that's not praise and worship. That's not worship in spirit and truth, scripturally speaking, and according to the Bible. What that is... It's just feeding your emotions. And there's a time, we're in a time now where God is had it about up to here with us, the church, just feeding our emotions. It's not about our emotions. It's about worshiping him, worshiping him, worshiping him and him only in spirit and in truth. So I want to say good morning. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn. I want to thank Pastor Paul. And you all just give Pastor Paul, because he... That one song um, uh, you wrote, Living and Dying Proof, he wrote that. That's an anointed song. I'm the living, dying proof. <laughs> it's actually his, his life somewhat in song. So I want to welcome those who are watching us by internet or by DVD. And before I get started, y'all can go ahead and turn your, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 6 if you want. But I want to tell you about our deliverance <clears throat> Our fifth Sunday of the month deliverance event or deliverance service, it'll be uh, this month, November 29th, here at the Mountain of God Tabernacle. And for those of you who may be watching by uh, video or by internet, it's 331 King Street, Mount Eagle, Tennessee. That's where we're loca located. And the time will be 11.30 a.m. That's Central Standard Time. And we invite everyone and we just say, come as you are. Come and receive your deliverance. And for those that don't understand what deliverance is, I'll just tell you what it is. It's part of Jesus' ministry. In fact, it's more than one-third of Jesus' ministry. It is the casting out of demons and devils. And if you've never seen that, I invite you to come because you're going to see what Jesus' ministry was like uh, because it's Jesus himself through the Holy Spirit and through us that gives people deliverance. It's not us doing it. It's him doing it. The only difference is he sits at the right hand of the Father now rather than walking uh, down the pathways here on earth and, and casting out demons and devils. And that's this month, uh, the 29th of November, 11.30 a.m. Now, I uh, hope you're turning to Acts chapter 6 because I want to tell you this is part 4 of my series entitled The Truth About the Book of Acts. Now, the reason I use the word truth in there is because there are denominations that they skip over that whole book. And then if they read some of it, they treat it like it's a lie. It's the Word of God. God cannot lie. So they skip the part dealing with certain things. And I'm going to cover uh, some of these things this, uh, this morning. For example, Acts 1 and 8 says, uh, and after the Holy Spirit has come, up, come upon you, you'll have power You'll have kingdom of power, and then a lot of denominations skip that section uh, for uh, a lot of reasons. One is that they don't want to lose control of their church. See, our church is spirit-led. I don't have control of it. I only govern over the uh, governing, governing ship that the uh, Holy Spirit has in our church. So a lot of pastors are afraid of losing control of their church, so they're going to skip over some of these things in the book of Acts because the book of Acts is really uh, the acts of the apostles and all that they did through the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, what I'm going to do uh, before getting into part four is reca recap some of what we already covered in part three, and that's because some people haven't heard part three, and you need to see this. You need to understand this. And I tell you, uh, we at the Mountain of God, God Tabernacle, Tabernacle need to understand it because we are now in a dispensation of time when God is using us to bring pastors up to a higher level in the apostolic. Uh, just recently, uh, we have ordained people who were pastors who were treated badly, if not poorly, by the church, and they couldn't understand it because all they wanted to do was what Jesus said to do. What's that? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And, of course, the church hierarchy uh, would stop them, would squash them. And they wonder what's going on, and then I get calls, and I say, oh, here's what's going on. You're called to be an apostle. You're not called to be a little pastor under a bunch of church doctrine that's not doesn't line up with the Bible. So you have got to learn how to be apostolic and how to move in that office, and that takes training. So in Acts chapter 6, let's just start with verse 1. It says, and in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. What this is saying is that the Grecian widows were saying that the Jewish widows is getting most of the food at the church. See, they're widows, and in that, those days, if their husbands had died, they had no way of making a living. So the church, uh, the job of the church was to feed these people, and that's what they're saying. Then the 12, this would be the 12 apostles who are head of the church. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them. These disciples are being discipled to be apostles and, uh, and said, it is not reason, that means it doesn't make sense, that we should leave the word of God and what? Serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. In other words, find you seven spirit-filled people that will take care of this business of feeding the uh, widows and making sure everybody gets their proper amount of food, their proper allotment. Verse 4, but we, that's the apostles, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer. In other words, what he's saying is we are not going to serve tables because if we do that, that takes away from our prayer time. He says, and to the ministry of the word. In other words, if we serve tables, that takes away from our preaching of the gospel. Verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. That means he come out of the Antioch church where he was saved. He's now in the Jerusalem church. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. That's one of the six doctrines of Christ in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2. And what this is, this is an apostolic impartation. They are laying their hands on them. Then look at 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. That means even some of the priests saw the truth because they had time to continue in prayer and time to minister the word. In other words, preach the gospel. So they even reached the priests. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So according to this passage of Scripture, as explained in part three of this series, these were not deacons that were appointed to serve tables, as many pastors will tell you, but you don't see the word deacon in there. What they were is they were pastors. And that's according to the biblical job description of what a pastor is and what he's required to do. In other words, pastors are commissioned by God to, quote, feed the flock. And according to what we just read, it's to be natural food, not necessarily spiritual food. Now, another way to say it is that they're called to wait tables as opposed to preaching the gospel like the apostles did. And that's referenced in verse 2. 
However, as also seen in this passage of Scripture, if we were to read on, for time's sake, we're not going to do it. You can read it on your own time or, or check it out in part three. But if we were to read on, also in this passage of Scripture, a pastor whose job is primarily to wait tables can rise to a higher level of God's structure within the church if he chooses to do so. Pastor Stephen, who we just read about, did just that. He went from being a waiter to being a full-fledged apostle who, according to what we just read, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And that's referenced in verse 8. So the good news for all you pastors out there is that there is a biblical foundation for you moving up in your positioning in God's kingdom. An Old Testament example of this can be found in the life of David, who went from being a shepherd boy slash pastor. They mean one and the same. The two terms are interchangeable. So David, as a shepherd boy, was a pastor. So it went from him being a shepherd boy and a pastor to becoming a king. In other words, he went from carrying the pastoral anointing to carrying the kingly anointing, which is the type of anointing that automatically comes with the office of the apostle. And I'm talking about those who choose to be true apostles. I'm not talking about someone who just wants to take a title so they'll look good and important in their church. I'm talking about someone who says, Lord, I want to be a true apostle. Teach me. What must I do to, to walk in this office? Then in the New Testament, we not only have Stephen who rose to the office of the apostle, but we also have one of his cohorts, Philip, who did the same thing. He went from serving tables to apostolically serving God directly through various missions that he was called to do. So taking up where we left off last week, turn to Acts chapter 8, and let's look at some of these missions that Philip was commissioned by God to do. Acts 8, let's just start with verse 1. It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, what that word consenting means is that this person named Saul sanctioned Stephen's death by stoning, which we read about last week. Now let me explain the reason why God allowed the church or uh, the church at, in Jerusalem to be scattered, unlike the church that we'll read about later in, at Antioch. What had happened is when God went and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the church in Jerusalem thought he meant go to all the Jews, go to all Israel maybe, and preach the gospel. Because at that time, they didn't think the Gentiles were even going to be included in the Abrahamic covenant of Christ. They didn't even know that or have that knowledge. It was still a mystery that Paul actually reveals later, the Apostle Paul. So when he told them to go into all the world, they just went to Jews. So God allowed that persecution to scatter them out into Samaria and other parts in the uttermost parts of the world so that they would preach the kingdom, preach the gospel to not only Jews, but to Gentiles. Now, the reason the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, because it says except the apostles, the reason they stayed in Jer Jerusalem was because they were the head of the church, and they had to be there in order for the church to keep running. In other words, they had to be there in order to keep the doors open. So look at verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. That's because he was stoned to death. And we read last week that some of the people did the stoning laid their garments at the foot of Saul while they went and picked up big stones and killed Stephen. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women and committing them to prison. Now, Saul is doing exactly what the Nazis did to the Jews during World War II. They're going into their homes. They're taking them all out. They're putting their, uh, they're uh, binding them. That means they're tying them up. They're arresting them, and they're going to try to 
kill them. Verse 4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So what they saw is that rather than wait till they come to our house and get us, we're going to get out of here. And while they go, they preach the gospel because they know the truth. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles. Notice the word miracles, which he did. And it says, for unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsy and that were lame were healed. So according to this, these two verses, this passage, if you will, the casting out of demons is considered a miracle. You understand that? I'll read it again. It says, um, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them. Calling that a miracle. Now, the reason it's a miracle is Jesus said it. If I, with the Spirit of God, cast out devils and the kingdom has come unto you, when the kingdom comes unto you, miracles will happen. The problem with the church in general today is they don't understand the kingdom. They don't understand opening up the heavenly portals. They don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit that comes and does miracles. Therefore, they don't accept deliverance as a whole. Because deliverance is a miracle. And again, I want to tell you, our deliverance uh, our conference is or, or deliverance service, the fifth Sunday of this month, uh, November 29th, starts at 1130 in the morning, Central Standard Time, and we're at 331 King Street in Mount Eagle, Tennessee. Now look at verse 8. And there was great joy in the city, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery. And bewitched, notice the word bewitched, the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. In other words, he was bewitching them and making them think he's a great person. To whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. In other words, he used witchcraft against them. He was using the power of witchcraft to make himself look important. Verse 12, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. He's talking about water baptism. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, water baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. In other words, all the deliverances and demons that were cast out and the people that were getting healed and so forth. Verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So they're sending the two top apostles, if you will. They're coming from the, um, I guess, the church in Jerusalem to, where they're, uh, to Samaria. Verse 15 who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Think about that. How can you as a pastor read this and see that average people are now getting the Holy Ghost, the baptism in the Holy Ghost? Then look at verse 16. For as yet he, that means the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, for as yet he was not fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they had been water baptized only. Then laid they their hands on them. Here it is again. A lot of churches today don't even lay hands on people. They don't understand it. They don't want to understand it. And yet it's biblical. And that kind of, kind of, I don't know, perturbs me a little bit. Because what you're saying is what Jesus did when he laid hands on and what the apostle Paul did when he laid hands on and what Peter and John did when they laid hands, you're saying that what they did is not scriptural. If you're not doing it, because Jesus said there's going to be those who will come after me and do the same things I do and greater things. What did he do? He laid hands on people. So you, you're supposed to be doing it. I mean, this is quite simple. It's a no-brainer to me. Look at 18. And when Simon, this is Simon the sorcerer, saw that through laying on of the apostle hand, hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. In other words, he wants to buy this from them, saying, give me also this, what? Power. 
give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, well, let me say something about that first. Evidently, he saw something because according to this scripture, he saw power. So what was he saying? Because what he saw, he wanted. He was seeing the power and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, which brought about the evidence of speaking in tongues. So in church, when they talk about this, oh, this tongue thing, we don't believe that. I'm sorry. Simon the sorcerer believed it. So why wouldn't you want to believe it? So what he saw was the evidence of speaking in tongues that goes along with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So for any Christian to believe that the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit they received at the time of their salvation is all they'll ever need, or that what they received at the time of their salvation is equivalent to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what they're doing is they're believing a lie, because this is truth. God's Word is truth. Anything that's not God's Word is a lie. Because what Simon the sorcerer saw was the power that all Christians need to do kingdom work. Now let me see. Let's go on down here. Um, to 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness. That's actually a demonic spirit. But he's in the gall of bitterness. That means he's still controlled by this spirit. We've met him. And in the bond of iniquity, he's also a spirit. He still, still controls Simon the sorcerer. What he's saying here is you're not saved, even though you've been water baptized, which scripturally does away with the false doctrine that water baptism saves you. See, if they'd read the book of Acts, they would get some of their doctrine corrected. That's exactly what it's saying. Because it said here earlier, it said he believed and he got water baptized. Now, Peter and uh, John's telling him, man, you're evil. You're not even saved. Then in 24, then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Now, the reason he's asking them to pray for him is because as a sorcerer, He's aware of the curses that can be spoken against him or against someone because that's what he's been doing to the people all along. So he's afraid of his own medicine. I look at 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go forth toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So the Holy Spirit's telling him to go to this area in the desert. And he rose and went. Now, that right there, went, is a sign of him being apostolic. See, at this time, he's apostolic, and he's, evangel he's an evangelist, possibly. But he's not a full-fledged apostle, or they wouldn't have had to send uh, Peter and John down there to uh, get these people spirit-filled. He would have known how to do that. But at, it appears that at this point of time in his uh, ministerial career, if you will, he hasn't yet been taught how to do that. So they send Peter and John down to do it, and of course they would be uh, uh, the model to him. It says, And he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So this is the man that evidently <clears throat> worships in Jerusalem. So he actually is under the Abrahamic covenant. He says, He was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. In other words, go to, up to where he is. And Philip ran uh, thither to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, and said, Understandeth thou what thou readest? In other words, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, and it quotes it. 
He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And we know who that is. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? In other words, is he saying that about himself? Is Isaiah saying that about himself? Or is he speaking of somebody else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So what the eunuch was reading was a prophecy that Isaiah had spoken about the coming of the Messiah, who is Jesus. It's in Isaiah chapter 53. Look at verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? In other words, there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if thou believeth with all thine heart, thou mayest. In other words, if you believe in Christ, then you can be baptized. Then he goes on to say, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So here's another verse that disproves the doctrine that water baptism saves. Because it says, you must first have to believe in Jesus Christ before you can be baptized. So I mean, this is like, you know, the problem is that most pastors and most churches aren't teaching their people to read the Bible. They say, just uh, listen to me and I'll teach you everything. And they're getting their doctrine from the hierarchy of the church, which a lot of times is, is in error. And that's what's happening. Because I, I remember talking to a lady. <clears throat> we had a lady in this church who had raised two people from the dead. And I remember talking to another lady. It was just in a restaurant. She said, well, how's the church going? And I said, well, we got a lady that a couple weeks ago raised somebody from the dead, and she's, oh, only Jesus can do that. You know, well, he did do that. But see, she's not taught that she could do it. See what I'm saying? They're, they're taught that, well, Jesus did it, and that's what he did. He was Jesus. He walked the earth. You know, when I confronted a person about water baptism, that it is not uh, something that saves you, I said, well, you know, the thief on the cross, he didn't come down to get water baptized, and Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know what their answer is? Oh, but that was Jesus when he walked the earth. That's when he was alive. And I think to myself, what you're saying is he's dead now, I guess, huh? Think about it. This is stupid. I mean, I can't I sound like Donald Trump, I know. But, but it really is. It is ignorance. Why don't you just read your Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the truth? And by the way, read the book of Acts. Don't skip over it. Uh, let's see where we're at here. Um, probably around 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. That means he translated him. He disappeared. Caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So according to what we just read, let me find my scriptures here. Yeah, Acts chapter 8. According to what we just read, Philip went from being a table-serving pastor to being an apostolic evangelist and eventually to being a full-fledged pastor apostle. See, if you're a full-fledged apostle, one of the, there's a lot of different signs. You can see the fruit of a full-fledged apostle. If you're not, a, if, if, if you want to know if you're an apostle, lay hands on somebody and, 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 and get them filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a good start. Don't call yourself an apostle if you ain't going <clears> to <throat> honor the doctrine of laying out of hands if you ain't going to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils, if you ain't going to do miracles, if you ain't going to raise the tabernacle of David, don't call yourself an apostle. You may be one later, but you ain't one at that time because it takes a while for you to learn all these things. It took me years. I remember the first time I saw a leg grow out. I was like, wow. Now put them in front of me. Got to do it every time, and you all have seen that. So it does take time. You don't learn it overnight. 
Now, the problem with most pastors who have the opportunity to do that is they don't want to put in the time. Why? Well, I got to go golfing. Let's see, I got to go fishing. I got to go hunting. The football games are on. Or the World Series is being played. I could go on and on and on. And I'm not against those. I'm not against sports. But there's other things they put in front of that. In other words, they're not sold out to the king. And you cannot be an apostle unless you're sold out to the king, period. And you'll find that every apostle in the New Testament was sold out to the king. They were sold out to the king uh, as much as when it came to, uh, time for them to, be, to die, they were crucified. They were boiled in oil. They had their heads cut off. That's being sold out to the king. Now, the reason I can say this with accuracy, the reason I can say that Philip is now an apostle is because the definition of an apostle is one who is sent by God on a special mission or special missions, which is what happened to Philip in verse 27 and verse 39. Now, he was, in fact, so much of a sent one that God, in his urgency, translated him to wherever he needed him to be. I mean, he would just disappear here and reappear somewhere else. Now, let's read on and see. Let's see, are we, uh, where are we at here? 37, place, scripture, let me see here. Okay, let's just read on then and go on into chapter 9. We're going to see how the Lord deals with this person named Saul who's been killing these pastors turned apostles. Now, before I read this, I want to tell you pastors out there, this is an opportunity for you. If you're in a church and you want to get some people healed, but you're, they don't believe in this, or you're in a church and you want to get some people uh, filled with the Holy Ghost and they don't believe in this, you're in a church where you know the laying out of hands can bring results in healing, deliverance, and everything else, but they don't believe in this, then you're in the wrong church. You're probably called to be an apostle because you are not going to keep an apostle, a true apostle, under your thumb. It doesn't happen. I work for one person. His name's Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe. That's it. I don't work for man. I will never work for man. I am not going to get into tradition. I'm not going to play church. I'm going to study this thing. I'm going to do what it says I'm supposed to do, and that's it, period. So if you're having those same type of problems and thoughts, and we've been having a lot of calls lately from pastors that are having that problem, things like, well, I just wanted to get some people healed. And now they're kind of like, you know, giving me the cold shoulder. I said, well, you're not in an apostolically governed church. If you was in an apostolically governed church, they would train you how to get people healed, and they'd say, don't do it. That's what Jesus did. He did it with the, the 12 disciples. He, t he, tra he preached it, and he showed them. He modeled it, and he said, don't do it. He did it in Luke chapter 10 with the 70. The 70 means multitude. So there might have been more than 70. There could have been a 1,000. And what he did is he showed them how to do it and said, go do it. And they went, and they did it. Remember, they come back and say, oh, Lord. They were so happy. He says, because uh, even the demons and devils are subject to us in your name. And he says, don't get all caught up in that. That's just your reasonable service. That's what he says. Because they were just like ecstatic that a demon actually would leave a person when they called him out in Jesus' name. After you've been in deliverance a while, you don't get too ecstatic over that anymore. You really kind of get to where, wow, Lord, I'll do this. But if there's somebody else wants to, they can have their, uh, my share of demons because I've been doing it so long. Because demons don't scare me anymore. Oh, they did in the beginning. They tried to scare us out of ministry. My first sermon I ever preached was on deliverance because I was at a church. I was the assistant pastor, and they allowed me to preach. After six weeks, you'd get a chance to preach. It was called a rotation. So I prepared a deliverance message. I thought, everybody's going to want to hear this. I preached it. Nobody wanted to hear it. They're about ready to throw me out of the church. So by doing that, I didn't realize at the time that I was in the wrong church. I was in the right church for that season, and then finally God released us, and he says, you're going to have your own church, and it's going to be my church, his church. I'm going to govern, and I'm going to govern through you. And then I was called uh, into the prophetic, then the office of the prophet, into the apostolic, then the office of the apostle. And we've been here in the mountain now for about six years, I guess. But we were down in the valley a lot of years before that. So look at uh, chapter 9. And Saul, 
yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. He wants to kill these people. And slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. Where is he going? He's going to the hierarchy of the church. Yeah, Saul is now. And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, in other any of those who are worshiping Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. What he's saying is give me the documents, the hierarchy of the church, you be my covering because I'm going to go into Damascus and I'm going to arrest all the Christians. I'm going to bring them back here where you can give them a trial, you know, just like you gave Jesus. <laughs> Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, the phrase kick against the pricks is a reference to the sharp goads that were used by cattle herders to move their livestock into the slaughterhouse. So what Jesus was saying was that Saul was like a cattle herder that was goading Christians to their death. And Jesus was uh, not very happy with that. Look at verse 6. And he trembling, that's Saul, and as astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So they heard something, and they heard a voice, but they didn't see anybody. So the Lord spoke only to Saul. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. In other words, he was blind. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. In other words, he was on a forced fast, whether he wanted it or not. And I'm sure he didn't feel much like eating and drinking then after what he had just gone through. you got to remember, this man had been killing Christians. Verse 10, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. That's where he was from. For beholdeth he prayeth and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. So he's praying now and he's getting visions. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this, of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests, the hierarchy of the church, to bind all that call on thy name. In other words, to arrest them. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. If you're a pastor and you want to be an apostle, you will have to be a chosen vessel. What's that mean? That means God says to choose you. It's that simply. How does he choose you? If he knows you want it, and you say, Lord, I want that. I want to serve you in the office of the apostle. Guess what? He'll give it to you. You become that chosen vessel. It says, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So Paul's, uh, uh, Paul's ministry was not just to the Gentiles only. Actually, it says here they were also to the children of Israel and to kings. Remember, he went to Rome and, and uh, had his audience with the emperor and so forth. Verse 16, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this required sufferings that Jesus is talking about here is the main reason why many Christians today, especially pastors, have refused to take up the office of the apostle. It's because there's a price and they'll have to pay, and most of them do not want to pay it. It's just the way it is, folks. The price the apostle Paul had to pay was that he was beaten, he was stoned to death, he was shipwrecked in the ocean for weeks, he was bitten by a snake, a viper, he was thrown into prison, and eventually he had his head cut off. He was decapitated. So I can understand why some of you pastors out there wouldn't want the job of an apostle, but it is available to you 
if you want it. <laughs> Look at 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, on Saul, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in, in the way as thou camest, in other words, on the road to Damascus, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Here's a regular Christian, if you will, Ananias, laying hands on this person and filling them with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. That means he was filled with the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean he was water baptized as some have preached because there's no water right there. He's in, a, he's in his house. He's in his home. And they didn't have indoor plumbing, so I doubt if there's any water there at all. He's talking about baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened, so his fast is broken. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem, in other words, the name of Jesus, and come hither? In other words, he's come here for that intent to get us, in other words, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is truly Christ. And after that many days were and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Boy, he's walking in the footsteps of Jesus, isn't he? But their laying await was known of Saul, but he was aware of that. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, and others he escaped him, he essayed, means he attempted to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. They had all heard of his reputation, Saul. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, in other words, on the road to Damascus, and that he had spoken with him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. So he was there for a short while. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, that's the Gentiles, but they went about to slay him. So they want to kill him as well. The Jews want to kill him. The Gentiles want to kill him. Verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus back to his uh, place where he'd be safe. Then, ha then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. So from this point forward, after Saul escapes the Grecians who want to kill him, he returns to his hometown of Tarsus, where he spends the next 14 years preparing his apostolic ministry. And after the 14 years is expired, we read about him again in Acts chapter 13, which we'll get to in another uh, part of this series. So we read about him in Acts chapter 13, where he's released from the Antioch church as the great apostle Paul. So I want to say, if you pastors out there, been living in sin, or you, you realize that you need to repent of all the error you've been teaching, guess what? You're not the chief sinners. Apostle Paul claimed to be the chief sinners. So God will still accept you into a higher office in his kingdom if you desire to have it. Close your Bibles and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, for your word is truth. We thank you, Father God, that this is your son, this is our Savior, this is Jesus in print, and he is the way and the truth and the life. We also thank you for the revelation of your word concerning the true structure of the last day apostolically governed church as portrayed in your holy scriptures. We ask it all in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ and Messiah, and everyone in agreement said amen. Thank you.
answers prayer. He answers prayer. Thank you for joining our live broadcast here from the Mount of God Tabernacle. We hope to see you soon, and may you have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ.